Today is June 5th, 2017. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 45. We're covering this week's stories, including the FDA's approach to artificial intelligence in healthcare, a novel method for human robot interaction, and automated data visualizations from Google Sheets. We're also going to check in with the community with our brand new It Came From Reddit section. Human Factors Cast is the only podcast whose hosts are 100% safe, hopefully, from robots taking their jobs as hosts. And it starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, what's going on, everybody? And Nick, how are you? Doing well, Blake. I can see you now. We're, we're, we're making some changes behind the scenes here at Human Factors <laughs> Cast, but we can now see each other while we do this for those nonverbal cues to make it easier for you guys to understand, hopefully. I don't know. There's, there's a natural flow... And you, and you kind of miss things if you don't have these nonverbal cues. So we're working on it. Blake how, Blake, how are you, buddy? Man, I am good, but not as good as that Star Wars polo you're wearing over there. Oh, man, you dig it? Yeah, it's my, <laughs> sporting my awesome. Darth Vader polo. Uh, so, man, I got I to gotta tell you something. I went to Universal Studios this weekend. Um, so my girlfriend's sister, it was her birthday, and we went and did the whole Wizarding World of Harry Potter because she's such a big fan, right? I, I, man. So epic. So are you aware that Universal Studios does this thing with, um, so like you buy the magic wand and you go and you sort of like wave your wand in front of these things and, um, you know, it makes, oh, yeah. stu- it makes stuff happen, right? You've heard of this? Yeah, you can go around the park and like interact with it with your wand, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, man, I got a I got a comment on this because when you when you think about user experience, you have to consider everyone, right? Es- sure. Especially those who are going to be using your product. So, let me describe to you what I saw. I saw a lot of small children going up to these uh they're like little markings on the ground. And so they go up to these markings and then they start waving their wand in the pattern up against the the whatever it is that they're trying to manipulate right with the wands and um and then i saw a lot of them get frustrated because they can't they the thing is with these gestural gestural controls you have to do it in such a like precise fashion at, at like a very specific location right and so the the devices aren't registering and i almost feel like you gotta and i get it like on one hand you want to do the right motion so that way you feel like you're doing the spell and once you finally master the spell you get it but you also don't want to frustrate your users and i saw more kids walk away from those things than not and in some of those places they actually had people standing there like helping you out with it like telling you you got to do it smaller you got to do it towards this thing right that's what you're trying to manipulate it just wasn't clear um but cool concept not not so great in execution. I just had to share that little story because we always like to go back about these, you know, these UX stories that we kind of encounter on everyday life, and that was one of them. What That's about you? Interesting that little kids had such a hard time, though, right? Because you right? would think it would be geared towards the lowest common denominator, and you know they're gonna have a harder time making oh, yeah. those, like specific motions. That's interesting. Yeah. What about you, man? I see you. I see you got some Netflix stuff up here. Oh yeah. So I've only noticed this across Netflix, like their web application and then on mobile, but they have these new skip intro and skip credits features. And I got to thinking about this because I was like, I was excited using it over the weekend watching Homeland. Of course, it makes my life easier. But then I got to really thinking about behind it. They're actually really encouraging the behavior they want from their user population. They want you to spend more time binging oh, yeah. on content like skipping over ads or skipping over the beginning and the end. And I just thought that was a really clever move because it ha- adds a lot of utility to me, but it certainly adds ROI for them, right? Oh, yeah, for sure, man. I got to tell you, too. I ha- So the new season of House of Cards came out, and I have not – oh, I know. I haven't I, What? I haven't seen it yet. Oh, my either. gosh. Yeah. I'm so I'm ready so for it. I'm so ready for it. So, like, I, I'm very excited, though, because that has one of the longest intros I've ever seen on a TV show, and I'm very yeah. excited for that skip intro button. All right. 
Well, I think we should move into the news because we got some juicy stories to talk about this week. This is the part of the show all about human factors news. Now, this could be anything from the medical field, transportation, psychology, artificial intelligence. We got a little bit of everything in there. You name it. As long as it relates to the field of human factors. (laughs) Blake's laughing at me messing up. Uh, Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right. So this combines kind of it all. A bit of healthcare, some AI, and mobile apps. So mobile healthcare apps and wearable devices that use artificial intelligence to help diagnose or even treat medical conditions pose a new regulatory challenge for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, better known as the FDA. So the FDA has responded by assembling a team of computer scientists and engineers to help oversee and anticipate future developments in AI-driven medical software. The new digital health unit will focus on certain apps and other software designed to diagnose serious medical conditions or guide their treatment. The, guy, the digital health unit must also ensure that the regulatory processes can accommodate the rapid and iterative process of software development and updates commonly used in improving these existing products and services. Further, as if you could add anything else to their tasks, the unit is responsible for also ensuring that the FDA's regulations are consistent with the work of regulators in other countries. Congress must review and vote on a new user fee agreement before it takes effect on October 1st, 2017. But once it's approved, it'll last until 2020. Man. Oh, sorry, 2022. Yeah, good job that on is, that. That was a long, that was a mouthful. <laughs> that is a lot to break down in one go. Wow. Wow. But this is, Nick, this is really exciting, but at the same time, a little worrisome. Because, uh, I mean, the FDA, we know, is really stringent processes, right? right? They have super strict guidelines, especially even for human factor usability tests. Like You yes. have to follow these things to a T. And I don't know about you, but how are they going to catch up with this agile software world we live in when we talk about applications? It's a challenge for sure, man. So I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm thinking, one, it's it's a good thing that they are sort of expanding their horizon into this frontier of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in terms of medical in terms of the medical field right because these um presumably these computers that can learn uh, a little bit more sophisticated than that but these computers that can learn about your vital signs and basically how you know potentially diagnose you with some of these um diseases or uh you know, heart conditions or whatever it is, it's it's really troubling that there is no regulation on it. So if anyone is to do this, I'm glad the FDA is doing it. But you're right. It does pose a unique challenge of how do you how do you sort of combat that agile uh, where, where things are always changing and where they have very strict guidelines? I don't know, Blake, what do, what do you uh, what are you thinking so I think in that aspect, they're just going to have to really loosen the grip on what they're, how they kind of now put regulations on projects, or they're going to have to expand how they deploy people to work with companies. Like the FDA would have to have their own specific software developers that they can shoot over to companies and let them assess these new changes well before they wanted them to release. Um, and, you know, I... I don't even know how this plays out for them in the whole anyway, because if you look back at the article, it talks about specific apps that do fall under FDA approval needs. And this is more related to anything that's AI using analytics to understand imagery. So like understanding if you have a normal heart or um, I think they mentioned cervical cancer is one. They also talk about screening for heart attacks, but something they talk about in here as well is apps that, try and help you combat different kinds of psychiatric problems like anxiety and depression. And they don't, that's something the FDA does not get their hands into. Right. And that's where we, where we get into the problem of talking about, okay, who regulates these apps and the claims they make? Well, I feel like the FDA is going to have to have a broader reach, not only being prepared for the iterative cycle of software development, but also making sure that these wide claims in terms of, medicine or any kind of help in a medical app are covered or at least accurate i guess is my concern right and you know i think one thing that will i mean they already have some of these um forms out there right like they've they've started circulating these so that way people can kind of understand what they're talking about right yeah i think that's covered a lot in this last 
bit where it's called the user fee agreement, where they're basically right. setting that out to developers and anybody who wants to make the app as a whole for that's related to healthcare. Got to understand if you want to get FDA approved, here's the hoops you need to jump through. But as we talk about at the end of this little blurb, that's not even voted on yet, whether that's going to be approved. And it only right. lasts for about five years. And, you know, I think I think one of the major things that would sort of reduce roadblocks is the the developers of these apps and web apps or whatever they are, they need, uh, I mean, look, software developers already document to a T patch notes, but they need to be very explicit in not only the changes that they made to the artificial intelligence, to the apps themselves, but also what are the implications? And I think it's going to require the companies who are working on these apps to start thinking a little bit more scientifically, so to speak, about what the implications of these changes that they're making in the software can make. And it's almost, to me, it's almost like working alongside a persona in in the development uh, cycle where uh, everyone is familiar with personas and they're basically just pieces of paper with art, uh, with fake users on them that help guide your design and help guide you while you're creating these changes to the system in order to better fit what they need. And I think, you know, I, I don't, I don't foresee anybody working on these projects uh, to take this with, you know, levity i guess it, it, it they're going to be taking this very seriously is what i'm saying and so i think you're right i think the fda is going to force that and so any kind of patch notes they're going to have to be tied to how it's affecting an end user right uh, like it, it much more explicitly than it is now exactly I, I think that's a great idea what you're talking about basically almost not enforcing but suggesting personas would be a good way to help you kind of release patch notes like based off of tom Here's what we're doing. Here's the change. Right. This is the effect. Well, I'm not even thinking. Well, I'm not. I wasn't thinking personas, but now that you bring it up, yeah, personas. I mean, so I was actually thinking it's more like a um, sort of a workplace culture where you know that the software changes that you are making are going to affect somebody's life in some way, in a critical way, I should say. And so bringing that awareness to the group that is developing it. I think it'll be a culture. And of course, you'll still have the personas. You'll still have Tom is uh, this old and uh, has these conditions. And, you gotcha, know. yeah. So I, it, I think this is much needed for these types of apps because, I mean, we've seen just over the last couple of weeks, we've seen, you know, a, 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 the iPhone can measure within 97% accuracy, uh, abnormal heart rhythms. We can we can see that this is where companies are starting to go. They're starting to, you know, leave these uh, diagnoses up to the computer because they can they can diagnose them so much better than humans can. And if we have some sort of regulation on it, it it only means good news. Yeah, I think you're right, Nick. I mean. This is this is only good for everybody who's either developing health related apps and consumers. Yeah, I I think so. Uh, are we ready to move on to the next one? Let's do it, man. Actually, before we do that, let me just big thank you to all our friends at the Next Web, Gizmodo, TechCrunch, and that last story was from the IEEE for bringing us all of our stories this week. If you want to follow along with the stories as we find them, be sure to head on over to all of our social media for links to the original articles. All right, now let's jump into the next one. All right, so switching gears a little bit, but still a little bit in AI. So Google Sheets is getting smarter today. So after the machine learning powered Explorer feature last year was implemented, which lets you ask natural language questions about your data, it's now expanding this feature to also automatically build charts for you. This means you can now simply ask Sheets to give you a far give you a bar chart for fidget spinner sales. That's an amazing sentence. And it will automatically build one for you. Other new features include an improved printing experience, a new chart editing experience, a new, a number of new statistical functions, and support for new keyboard shortcuts. What's now, a- I feel a little bit mad that I never actually <laughs> noticed this Explore function in the first place. I thought it was just kind of like how other products exist and that it w- you could build you know, charts from it, but... This sounds awesome with the natural language. Man, okay, okay. So first off, I want to know what far charts are. What are those? Oh, far charts? <laughs> you said yeah. you said far charts. Uh Sugar bar. Excuse me, kids. <laughs> uh no, you did you did correct and say bar. Um 
So this is, I wish I also knew about the, uh, what, what, explore feature, because I use Sheets all the time. Uh, we use Sheets for our analytics on the podcast. We use Sheets, oh, I use Sheets, whoa, I use Sheets for several different projects, uh, not because of the robustness, because Excel is a lot more robust, but because of the online capability. You, uh, there's, there's a unique feature with Sheets that I really enjoy, which is the import function. You can basically web scrape from other apps. And so if I can integrate that with, uh, you know, these, these sort of charts that will presumably auto populate for you, if you ask it, you know, about something that's neat. I, this article goes so much further than the data visualization, although it's a very important piece. The thing I'm most excited about is now we can do chi square, uh, <laughs> In, uh, I had a feeling you were going to say something about that. Oh, man, statistical analysis in, in Google Sheets? I love it. No, we, Yeah, that was an interesting pick as well. I mean, it's good for statistical analysis for sure, but right. uh, maybe he's only pointing out a specific one for this well, article. He's he's pointing out the robustness now of these, uh, these, these statistical analyses you can run. So the example he gives is chi-square inverted RT. And that's the inverse of the right-tailed probability of the chi-squared distribution. So, precisely for all you stats nerds out there, <laughs> <laughs> now you know. Now, now, to be honest, Nick, the feature that I was most like excited about was because, like, right now I'm putting together some slide decks for sponsorship stuff, and I've I've like got data in two different sheets that I'm messing with from two different parties. And right. I'm like, I'm, I'm the sole one in charge of them. And they're all integrating seamlessly into both like slides that I'm making as well as like write up documents that I have to do. Yeah. And I didn't even realize that it was happening until I read this article and went and go, went to go check. Cause I'd made changes this morning. Cause I had had problems in the past with other software that like has this capability, but it wouldn't necessarily update. And I think a lot of it has to do with the cloud infrastructure and all that kind of stuff for Google, man. Let me tell you, I, I think, you know, because we used to work together on on this project, but there's a project that consistently has issues with updating metrics and reporting. And man, this is this is the holy grail of metrics reporting. Let me just yeah, let me this just would say be a way to do it, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I <don't... laughs> no, I'm telling you, man, get some Jira integration in there, and and uh, we're set. <laughs> Ooh, there you go, right there. That's a plug-in for sure. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, <laughs> we are nerding out about nerd this. stuff, oh, dude. Man. I could okay. nerd out about Excel and and Google Sheets all day. I mm, metrics are are my jam, man. <laughs> <laughs> Just so everybody knows, in the Slack for our show, I get pictures of metrics at least once a week, oh, probably more, uh, but uh, I know several at least times. Once a week. Several times, I I love looking at the stats and charts and to see how engaged all of you are with our programming. And uh, what works and what doesn't. So you'll constantly see us kind of switching gears because of what you guys are responding to. So just a little pulling back the curtain for everybody. Uh, I always like it when other podcasts do that. So I try to I try to be as transparent as possible. But we're still putting on a show. So you got to keep the magic at least alive a little bit. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next story. All right. So ha I certainly have, but have you ever wondered what an autonomous vehicle sees by its sensors, its onboard computing, and some of its sensor fusion systems? Well, Civil Maps, a map technology company, published a video that reveals some of what's going on when it comes to combining detailed 3D maps with sensor data taken from LiDAR, optical cameras, radar, and other onboard vehicle hardware used to take stock of the world around an autonomous vehicle. Civil Maps explains that its technology localizes a car in six degrees of freedom to help a car focus its sensors exactly where they need to be, paying close attention on the road at any given moment. This results in computational power and sensor load savings, which is huge when you're an automaker trying to balance the cost of producing an autonomous driving system with putting something safe and effective on the road. Now, I really encourage anybody to, that's listening to the show that if you can, stop the podcast, go watch this video that Silva Maps produced because it is really intense to check out how these cars are actually automating and able to make decisions on the road. And they do a really good job like with the color coding of what the car knows and also annotating throughout the video. Um, right. 
And this, so, okay, so now that you're back, you pause the podcast, you watch the video. If not, go ahead, we're waiting for you. Uh, this video, so I actually worked on a project that was very in its infancy when I left it, but kind of looking at autonomous vehicles and the importance of kind of how the operator of the vehicle needs to understand these things, these very things that are in this video in order to stay in the loop with an autonomous vehicle, right? So if the human can sort of understand the logic behind the self-driving car, then they are more likely to understand the choices it is making. So if you have a child and a ball in front of you and it registers the child is red and the ball is green, it's going to go for the ball because... You don't want to hurt a human life. But, you know, if you were to suddenly look up and not be aware of what's going on, then you wouldn't, you might want to regain control and go the wrong way and accidentally do something horrible. So, I mean, th another example would be if you were to, um, or not another example, but another way like this could be useful, right, is if they were watching this play out on sort of, you wouldn't need like a speedometer. You wouldn't need any of those controls unless something major happens, right? So what if you replace that whole display, speedometer, uh, gas gauge, all that stuff? What if you replace that with something like this where that you get in real time, similar to what Tesla does uh, with their, um, wow, why am I blanking on it, on their autopilot feature? They, they do oh, something yeah. very similar where they actually show you where the car is paying the most attention to. Is it paying attention to the lines? Is it paying attention to the car in front of you? Is it paying attention to the cars on the sides of you? And if you were to watch this, you know, uh, um, kind of play out as a video form in front of you, you could very easily understand what the computer is being able to see, what pieces, and more importantly, what pieces of the environment are not being seen by the computer and what implications might that have for the automation i don't know this is a very rich topic but i'm interested in what your what your thoughts on this one are blake so i like when i saw the note you had about keeping the human in the loop when i watched the video i was a little confused about how this was actually implemented like is this just the backgrounds of how the automation is actually working which i think is what really the video is showing right so so this video is basically it's a marketing tool to say, look, all of our systems are talking together and because, you know, various um, various systems take up various resources in computing power, this is what we're looking at at this time while we're making these decisions. And that gives us better computational power to make better decisions in that context. But the thing that it does lack is so, so it's, it's localizing basically where it's paying attention to and you know obviously there's still some resources dedicated to like behind it or whatever in case somebody comes up to you or uh, something unexpected comes out into the road it's still looking for those things but it's not spending as much resources on it as other systems and this is to my understanding this is basically just a marketing tool for car dealers uh, or car makers to um, implement into their systems and uh, but I, I did want to highlight this as a human factors thing because this this display this sort of how the computer sees the world you want that to be congruous with how the operator sees the world and if if the operator can understand what the computer sees then it sort of bridges that gap yeah and kind of what i was what i want to piggyback off of that at least is when i was watching the video i was thinking okay th if this display is nowhere and this is just logic that somebody has in their head about how the vehicle operates. What I didn't see or and wouldn't be able to tell from a promotional video like we're talking about is, is the human actually still interacting with the car or right. is it going navigation based? Because they at one point in the video, the car knows that it can take a left turn. Now, is that coming from the navigation that's already programmed in it saying, OK, we're going to take a left to go to the grocery store or is the human now? hitting the turn signal so now the automation knows. So keeping them in the loop by forcing them to actually still interact similarly how, to how they would drive. Right. Um, I, I think that lends itself to be a better model than just purely putting them behind there, letting them know the knowledge, but then get lost in the ether right. while 
sitting back doing nothing. Well, and see, what you bring up is a, a point of contention for a lot of researchers right now. They're actually trying to find ways to keep the human engaged. And, you know, I've read a couple papers on uh, do you give them a quiz about what's around their environment and they have to keep answering or yeah. else the car will shut down? Like, there are some really interesting ways on how to potentially solve this problem, and we haven't really cracked it yet. So there are researchers out there trying to figure it out. Um, but yeah, you do bring up a good point about is this user-generated navigation or is this pre-programmed navigation, and how do you sort of uh, keep that human in the loop Yeah, where's with that? the good middle ground for you to like, have a safe and efficient car, I guess? Yeah, I think that's a good... Uh, Good time to move on to the next story. For sure. All right. So if you are jealous of Tony Stark's Iron Man suit, I am. but don't have the billions of dollars to build your own, a group of Japanese researchers have come with a cheaper and arguably more useful alternative. We will talk about that. An extra pair of robot arms that can help you out when your limbs are busy. So they call it Meta Limbs, and it works by mimicking the movements of the user's legs. Motion tracking gear attached to their feet and knees directly translates the wearer's leg motions to the arms, giving the user precise control over their new helper limbs. Meta limbs will officially be unveiled at the upcoming SIGGRAPH 2017 conference, although the video online gives us our first look at how these arms work. Now... These things look really cool, but I question the function functionality of some of them. Uh, Nick, tell me what you thought about the arms. Man, these arms are... Okay, so look, man, this is a ridiculous story. <laughs> but, but is it? But, or is it? Or is it, right? That's That's the question. That's why I put it in here, because I want us to talk about something like this. So on the one hand... Yes, this seems ridiculous. This guy has a backpack with arms coming out of it, the robotic arms, and he controls them with his feet. At the surface level, that seems very ridiculous. But what if this is the next way to interact with things? What if you're typing and you want to take a drink with your soda? So you manipulate your foot to grab your drink and you like sip it to your face while you're typing away. College students can now drink their monster and type their essay at the same time. They have zero excuses. <laughs> there you go. You, you have to be a multitasker at this point. I mean, you've got the feet. Or if, well, hopefully you have the right? feet. <laughs> but <laughs> what I couldn't get, get was how, how it would feel getting tactile feedback like, like that on your feet. Because, I mean, that was basically how, how it works is you have monitor – like motion monitors that are on your feet and also on your knees, but also some tactile grips that go on your feet and some bending transistors to let you know that you're like flexing almost like you would your hand. Right. Um, and I just did not know because one of the, for listeners that are listening to us, I mean, the opening video is the guy with the extra arms. He's typing on his laptop and the thing, the arm goes, grabs his phone and supposedly answers it for him. And I was thinking, like, that's really not that far fetched, no, um, of a, of a concept to go. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty cumbersome design with so many sensors, but it's meant to be you sitting down. So, I mean, if it has that kind of dexterity in the fingers, I could see it working for a few different things, like holding the phone, letting you drink a drink. I don't know, light your own cigarette for you. Who knows? Right. Yeah. And I mean, so another application potentially is you're carrying something heavy. And you uh, need to manipulate like a door or something, right? So you have two hands on this heavy object and you need to manipulate a door. So you reach out your foot and you like kind of pull it towards you. Like, I don't know, man. So, yeah, it's ridiculous. But there are. Yeah. To <laughs> Sorry, I just read the reread the line about uh, and you can't forget using them to rise to the top of UFC fighting leagues. So, yes, <laughs> I mean, man. Like, this is just one of those stories. you got to go check out this video. Uh, and like I said, you can find all our stories on our social media. And this is one of those ones that you just have to see to believe. It is something else. And honestly, the applications for this are endless. Endless. But you laughed. Hang on. Before we move on, I, you laughed at the thought of maybe this is potentially more useful than the Iron Man suit. And I have to know why. 
Why do you think that this is not more useful than the Iron Man suit? Honestly, because I do not have as much confidence in my ability to use my feet to control hand motions. But you have confidence in your in your ability to control your feet to control flight? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> boosters ago all right quick sidebar did you see that video of the guy who actually built the uh iron man suit like he has no. jet repulsors on his arms and legs and he actually like takes off are you serious dude go watch the video i got it. i'll send it to you after this it's it's this is awesome no it's crazy it's crazy is what it is like this guy is nuts <laughs> <laughs> light himself on fire for sure oh yeah and well i mean like some of it looks like it really hurts like because he he turns on the motors or the jets and one of them like throws his arm back and I'm like, Oh, that's, that's gotta hurt. Oh my God. You need that exoskeleton for that noise. Uh, all right. What do we got up next? All right. So researchers from Weiss Institute and Harvard S E A S. We call it C's have developed a soft robotic exosuit that can significantly boost a person's running performance. The device requires a tether and external power supply to work, but once it becomes portable, it can help athletes run faster and further than before, smashing their existing records without having to undergo additional training. The textile based design is lightweight and moves with the upper body. Its flexible wires are connected to an external actuator unit, which provides it with power. And when a person runs on a treadmill with the suit on, the actuator actually pulls those wires. Once activated, the wires perform the function of a second set of hip extender muscles, extensor muscles, excuse me, applying force to the legs with each stride. During tests, the device is shown to reduce meta the metabolic cost of running by 5.4%. And you can find this study in the Journal of Science Robotics. Oh, man, this one has crazy implications. If you thought that putting spring legs together was going to change the running game, this is really going to make a whole lot of difference in how people run. What about this with spring legs? Oh, you're, you're the best ever. You're superhuman. You're so f you're just flying. Yeah. You might as well put on the Iron, Iron Man, Man suit. suit. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Jeez. Man, so DARPA is up to some really great things. I am consistently impressed <laughs> with DARPA's ability to come up with these wacky ideas to create super soldiers. And these it's like this is basically super spandex uh, from what I'm seeing <laughs> with batter like a battery powered super spandex that makes you run faster and consume less energy while doing so. So now that makes me retort any problems that I had with it because I didn't even think about the military application of this for I don't know, SEAL teams or even just anybody in the military that has to do a lot of a lot of running or any of that kind of stuff. Come on, um, Blake. What are you doing over there? <laughs> well, for me, the I mean, the first thing that they talk about is breaking records and running, and you don't have to train as hard anymore. So it, it was bothering me. I was like, well, that takes a, a lot of like the right. hard work that people put in for training, I don't know, VO2 max or athletic ability takes a lot of it out. But what I did really admire was the science behind all of this. Yeah. And the fact that they had enough, um, like thought put into all of this, that they didn't just monitor a runner's legs. They were looking at their entire posture to make sure that when they were using the exoskeleton, or I guess we're going to call this an exo suit in this case. Yeah. Um, exo shorts, if you will. It, it tried to pay attention to their entire form, not just like, is it moving the legs up and down and up and down, um, which is known to that will eventually help people with their running alignment anyway. So it could be used as a rehab tool. Um, and also the ex energy, energy expenditure ratio. They also looked at that, too, which uh, in in these types of situations is, is uh, very necessary. And I almost wonder we talked about the uh, exoskeleton the other week with Lowe's, and I wonder how much that reduced their um, metabolic cost. Yeah, that's actually a, a really good point. Um, I don't know, because that, that one probably would reduce it a large amount, because if you think about it, you're lifting a really heavy weight and now oh, you're yeah. not having to exert nearly as much energy at all. So really, you get that, the spring ankles, the spring, the spring you're loaded, what did you call them? I don't even know. <laughs> what am I saying? The spring feet. Spring feet. And uh, the uh, super spandex. And, man, you have a super soldier right there. Or. It's, or, it's there. Or, yeah. Or you're halfway to Sigourney Weaver. 
Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought of when I like read the title for this article. Right. Yeah. Oh man. All right. So obviously the applications of this are great. Uh, Blake, what, what can I see you using this for in your everyday life? Honestly, I'm going to pull kind of a fast one here. I hate to run and I'm real bad at it. I would use this to go on runs with a lease because I just can't do it. I give up and I get really tired really easily. I would totally use this to go run every day. Man. Yeah. I'm just thinking about like, would I run if I had one of these? And the answer is maybe. Yeah. I for sure, I for sure, especially speaking from personal experience of the last weekend, I for sure would use it when I go to theme parks or anytime would I, like any event that I'm have, having to be up and walk around all day, strap one of these spandex spanks on and, and be good to go. Killing it, man. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Let's move on to the next story. All right, so keeping it AI this week. Okay, so as artificial intelligence and robotics continue to pick up steam, thousands of jobs we could once take for granted are at risk of being automated, threatening to leave a bevy of diligent workers on the dole. But there might be a tool that can consult that you can consult to take the necessary measures before your time has come. Will the Robots Take My Job is an amusing web-based tool that predicts how susceptible your occupation is to the ever-growing current of automation and computerization. The website lets you fill in your role and proceeds to calculate what the odds are that this job will one day be outsourced to robots. The tool further provides additional data like the total number of people employed at each occupation, as well as the projected growth for its respective field by 2024. Now, Nick, I looked at a couple of the like results they had. They had a couple of GIF results that I guess they had done. And it kind of surprised me that technical writers and statistical assistants are in trouble. Yeah. I was thinking like more of automated vehicles type of stuff. But that's like some heavy duty, you know, it's not easy to write about technical stuff. And it's certainly not easy to do statistical analysis. That stuff makes sense to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, it does. Because statistical analysis... It's just equations, and if you plug in the right equations, you only need to set it up once, and then the data forever will be analyzed in that way. Or you could teach a computer to look at the data and kind of understand what needs to be analyzed based on that data. Now, technical writers, if you're just writing for like a technical paper about the capabilities of something, it makes sense to me. You're just objectively, it can, it can source definitions from other places, and we're talking about, what, seven years in the future from now? So... I mean, just look at the advances in AI we've seen in the last six months, man. Well, for that one, I feel kind of ridiculous because you ha- you've you created something that's like a, at least a pro- based program that can yeah. help create documents that have been written. So, I mean, of course, AI could take exactly. that Exactly, and, and maybe right? that's why I wasn't so surprised uh, because I built one myself. But, Very true. But SpongeBob SquarePants is definitely in trouble because cooks, fry cooks in the fast food industry, 81%. Uh, oh, that's not good, SpongeBob. Oh, oh I know. Uh, let's see here. What else do we got? We got uh, correspondence clerks, 86%. That's interesting. We got, oh, 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 wow. This one. Okay, so if you're out there and you're looking for a job that is completely secure, go the human resource manager's route. 0.55% likelihood that you will get taken over by robots. So what? We will, That's pretty good. No, and it makes total sense. We will not have robots managing our human resources. That, to me, if we, uh, if we, if we do that, then we signal the robot uprising right away because they can then manage us. And uh, yeah, it's just bad news. How about ninety nine percent for ninety nine percent likelihood that robots will take the job of insurance underwriters? I'm not even sure what that is. I, I don't know either. I just <laughs> random. Hang on. Do they, do they write under an insurance? Insurance so under. Is... What is that? Um, a com- a use computer software programs to determine whether an applicant should be approved. Ah. Oh, that makes, makes total sense. sense. Yeah, yep. dude. Now, uh, a few a few more relevant ones for us. UX designer, you ready for this one? Oh man, what is this? Or I guess they don't have UX designer. Let's do graphic designers. 8.2%. You're safe. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right. Let's do uh, human factors engineer. 
Oh, I wonder if they have that one specifically in there. Well, psychologists. So, psychologists were safe at 0.43%. Which you can imagine, that's a lot of the resources line again. When it comes to that, since psychologists is a wide branching, like I mean, clinical or applicable, right? Whoa, you're kind of breaking up there, Blake. Uh, but yeah, oh, no. Oh, no. That's okay. It's okay. I think you're coming back. But yes, no, it is. It does have to do with the human element, I believe, uh, for these guys. Uh, are there any other ones that we should check out here? Well, I do have one that's already kind of pre-done, and I know for software developers, especially for applications, it looks like you're looking at a 4.2%. So safe and sound, kids. That's that's pretty good. Um, I'm trying to think. Let's see. I was going to say cognitive scientists, but that would have fa- fallen under... Uh, the wide branch of psychology. Yeah. Um, power plant operators, though. That one just that one just popped up. Oh, really? Eighty five percent likelihood that computers will take your job. Ugh. Whoa, that's Hang kind on. of impressive. Air traffic control. Oh, then that one I feel like is yeah. Eleven percent. That one's eleven percent of nuclear operators is even is like skyrocket size. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. Well. Automation. In instance, maybe it's not. Automation you risk have to deal level. With so many different variables. In the AI, I feel like I don't know. Automation risk level. No worries. <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> Good. Um, let's look up. Uh, oh shoot! I had another one, but I uh, uh, I forgot. It was, it was something uh, related to the field, but uh, oh, I was going to look up uh, infantry. I just want to see. Oh, there you go. Um. It did not come up. They don't. They don't have it. Okay. Well, that was fun. Airplane pilots, go pilots, and flight engineers, though eighteen percent. So we're still risk level, no worries. All right. So if you're any one of those jobs, you are uh, either really safe, or if you're an insurance underwriter, then I'm so sorry for you. But I'm start freaking out. <laughs> but if you want to check this out for yourself, like I said, go check out those original articles. This one is: Will robots take my job? And uh, you can you can plug in there. Uh, now, Blake, I would like to switch gears. And would you? Yes, I would. And I want to introduce our brand new segment that we like to call "It Came from Reddit." Now, this is a part of the show where we're going to search all over Reddit, right, to bring you topics, to bring you, our listeners, topics that the community is talking about. So this means any subreddit is fair game. Within the last week, as long as it relates to the field of human factors, and it has, this is the kicker, it has to encourage discussion among the community. So I'm going to read today's entry, and this one comes from the user experience subreddit from user Andre Hash. And Andre Hash writes, how can I use my time optimally to practice UX? He then goes on to say, As it seems right now, I'll have a lot of time on my hands this summer, so I thought why not spend this time in a beneficial way and practice my UX and UI skills. I'm a first-year UX design student, so I have some user testing and prototyping experience. I'm just unsure how to spend this free time optimally to improve my skills. It's worth noting, I would like to do something with video game UX, but since we've only worked on improving websites and apps so far, I have no idea where to start with such a project. Any advice or ideas are very much welcome. Well, user Andre Hash, we are here to help you break it down. So there have already been some great uh, responses on your thread, but um, I feel like it's important to facilitate these discussions because we do have a lot of listeners that are in graduate school or uh, undergrad who are potentially going on to human factors, and it's, it's always a good idea to sort of help people understand how to monopolize their time to be successful. Now, Blake, I see you have like a ton of good advice here. You want to go over some of that? Yes. Okay. So first up, I went through the subreddit to make sure that I credit anybody and I can't recommend this particular user's advice enough. And his name is Atticus underscore F U R X. And so he gave the advice for Andre hash to join local UX groups and check out things on LinkedIn. And I, just hosted a webinar last week with a, an author and UX leader in the UX community in LA. And he even said himself that, I mean, he started a local chapter of interaction design associated or associates, I think so that he could find mentors. And these 
little groups, meetups, whatever you call it, they really help you start that networking circle. And I really encourage this guy to check out and see if there's any user experience professionals in his group. Uh, I'm part of the LA chapter, but there's groups across the entire globe for UXPLA or UXPA. And if there is one, I'm telling you, be the groundbreaker, start the chapter. It's You'll benefit yourself, but also a small community of UX people around you, especially if you're a fir- first year UX student. Um, one big one, if you find yourself with a lot of free time, especially there's a lot going on on UX design slack. Oh yeah. So join in there. That's the way to go. There's a lot of heavy hitting authors. I mean, we're talking like Jared Spool, Dave Maloof, and there's a plethora of topics from like learning how to start to being a serious leader. Um, plus it, it makes you contacts worldwide. I mean, you can right. join in the discussion, see what's going on, pull articles. Yeah, man. Before, you, before you continue, I just want to second, like these connections that you build are paramount. Uh, and, and sort of getting yourself into these opportunities that will allow you to make connections like these, that's, what's going to get you far. Um, and I mean, obviously the skills are important, but if you position yourself just right to get these sort of connections, make yourself a LinkedIn, reach out to people in the field, um, and develop your skills accordingly to what you want to do. It's tremendously valuable. All right. I kind of took the show from you. Go ahead, Blake. (laughs) Uh, so, no, man, I think the advice is definitely warranted. Uh, small thing for you, if you if you want to get into the video game industry, I think what might be a small challenge for you is trying to make your own game. Because um, then you have to document how you were able to get through the struggles of building a game and what your process was, and you learn a little bit more about yourself. Um, if you don't know where to start, check out Code Academy. they got like a small javascript word game that you can build uh that features justin bieber i got rid of justin bieber in mind but you can start there yeah um also too if not this year if you're a first year student look for internships that's the best way to build up your resume and figure out what it's like to work in your field to be honest right and and uh okay so going on my rant here yes the um The documentation of what you do and what skills you have is valuable. Now, even if you think you may not ever revisit those skills, document them. So, for example, I worked on lab rats in my undergrad uh, for a lab, and like I, I never have gone back to that, but I have that on my resume just to remember that I did that. And that goes for any skills that you may have done. If you've taken an HTML and CSS class, write that down document it if you have like experimented with javascript in some way write that down document it like even if you've done things kind of tangentially document it don't put it on your final resume if you're not comfortable with it but at least document it to say hey yes i have done that at some point and i can speak to it if i need to one piece of advice that i would also give to you is uh you're you're talking about like how to spend your free time right or how to use your time optimally and you can do a lot of things in your free time that you may not necessarily think of. And this is something that Blake and I try to do on a weekly basis where we bring you these kind of interesting bantery stories, right? It's about our experiences in everyday life. Just kind of try to keep an eye out for what's going on around you and sort of appreciate how it's designed. Everything, for the most part, is done with intention. And it's very noticeable when things are intended to be easy for a user to experience see what i did there user experience but it's <laughs> i know blake's like so good <laughs> yeah yeah he's uh he's not very happy with that joke <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean look like next time you're playing a video game like check out what kind of things are on the screen what the icons look like what the uh how do you access the map how you access the uh, sort of quest scheme. Like there's a bunch of different ways and these were all z- designed specifically to be fun for the player and start kind of uh, thinking about what was the design process or what could have been the design process behind that. Did they do usability tests for it? Um, uh, go check out some usability methods. Like that's that's another great place to start. How do people arrive at these decisions? So there's a lot of great things that you can do. And like I said, uh, a bunch of users already commented on your um, 
on your post with some great advice and uh we we agree with all those read tons um you know develop skills and uh reach out to other people all those are great pieces of advice so hopefully this helps you out and uh you know if it does please feel free to reach back out to us like i said we're from now on we're going to try to get out there in the community and kind of give back to those who have given to us <laughs> Well put, sir. Well put. Blake, do you have any closing advice for user Andre Hash? Uh, Andre Hash, I know it's probably early in the game, but something that I've struggled with throughout my career is uh, strategy and developing it as far as we, with regards to UX. Uh, so I highly recommend there's a book that's called literally that UX strategy by I think it's Jamie Levy or Levi. Um, and it really helped me with ironing out my own processes and then trying to think about how to document it along the way so that I could put it in a portfolio or show other people. Um, so that's kind of all I've got. Awesome question. Hope, hopefully some of this helps. And, and you know what? Andre Hash, if you're listening, thank you for listening, first off. But second, feel free to reach out to us, too. We are, we are resources. We'd be more than happy to talk about it with you. We've been there. That's it for today, everyone. If you want to know, if you, well, you know what? Let us know what you think of this new segment. Did you like it? Did you hate it? Let us know. If you have any questions or for topics or any news stories that you think we might have missed, you can follow us on social media. Let us know over there. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Uh, you can join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail. If you're saucy, at uh, 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing, we bring these to you ad-free. You can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, I want to thank you for being on the show today and helping me break down all these news stories. Where can our listeners go and find you? Oh, you guys can always find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX, and I hope your Monday is wonderful. Yes, it is Monday. Oh, man, it's only Monday. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends. It depends. It might depend on something. Depends on all that stuff.